Hey, it is Tiki Technical Tuesday, and we are getting back to work on this little fellow, the porcelain pounder. Oh, hang on a second. You will remember in the last episode, we sculpted this, and I'm going to have to be honest with you, I've done a bit of work since we filmed that last episode. What have we done? Well, I went ahead and made the mold. Now, I know, I know, I know that you all love to see the mold making process, but sometimes, well, I just don't have time to film it. So we're gonna do a quick catch up here and show you the mold that I ended up making for the porcelain pounder. And it is a, let's see, it's a one, two, three, it's a four piece mold. So here we go, we've got the base, we have got the back piece, and then I did the face in two sections. Let's see, we've got this one here, here, and we've got the final piece here. There we go. So this is where we're at. We've got the molds. They are all dry. And in fact, over the last few weeks, I have been doing a lot of casting with them. And I thought for this episode, I would show you the process of casting porcelain. In this case, a cool black porcelain. Let's get to it. Okay, good morning. It is 6.30. I just saw a fox. Oh, that is the best way ever to start the day. Let's pour some porcelain pounders, shall we? The porcelain pounder molds live on this little cart, which makes it easy to get out of the way when we're not casting them up top. We have all three molds, and on the bottom, I'm keeping a couple of the gallons of the black porcelain slip. We kick things off by agitating the slip, uh, just like the normal stoneware slip that we use. Uh, this will gel when it sits overnight, so I like to mix it up, get everything nice and fluid and liquidy, so it's ready to pour. We carefully pour the liquid porcelain into all three molds and let it dwell in those molds for exactly 22 minutes. Okay, so while the slip dwells in the molds, I can talk about these containers. As you notice, we're not using the slip table behind me, which is what I normally use on slip casting. And that's because I have the slip table filled with my normal Laguna stoneware slip. Uh, the porcelain uh, cannot go in there because I have the other slip in there. So we're keeping the porcelain in these um, kind of gallon jugs and, and whatnot. It is. It reminds me of how I started slip casting. I started slip casting using this exact thing. I'd buy my slip by the gallon or buy five gallons and five gallon buckets. And I pour it into pitchers and use that to pour into molds. It's a bit of a hassle. You'll especially see when it comes time to drain these molds and put them back into the containers. It's a little humbug, but it's okay. We can, we can work with it. You don't need a fancy slip table to do slip casting. These work just fine. Um, the only thing is sometimes I will lose a little bit of the slip, and that is tricky because this porcelain slip is not cheap. It is a precious material, so I want to try to capture every little drop that I can. In the long run, if we um, do these porcelain pounders for a long time, which I, I plan on doing, maybe someday I get a small little slip table set up just for the black porcelain. That would be kind of a dream item to have, maybe on wheels, I can push it around and get out of the way when we don't need it. Um, but for now, and for quite a while, I imagine, we're gonna be shuffling these things around. Our 22 minutes is nearly up, and that means it's time to get ready to drain the molds. So I put these little wooden racks out to uh, set the molds over, and I've got a recollection bucket, which is just the original bucket that's empty now. What are we collecting in this bucket? Well, we're collecting the slip that's currently sitting inside of the plaster molds. So I let these drain a little bit into this container. I want to capture uh, like 95%, 90, 98% of the slip that's in here. I'm not gonna get it all. I could agonize over getting it all, but honestly, that's what the slip table's for. Uh, I'm just gonna let these drain as much as I can, and then they go here. Oh! <laughs> Good thing I got that on camera. It's my first spill. It is a workout. 
Okay, so we're gonna let these sit here for 45 minutes. In 10 minutes, I'm going to flip them over uh, so they get a little more airflow. Um, but yeah, we won't open these molds for 45 minutes. In the meantime, let's sand some bottoms. Okay, I'm at the sink here. Uh, the, the molds here are still dwelling behind me. And while they dwell, I am going to work on the castings that we pulled out of the kiln the other day. Uh, I have no idea how I'm going to edit all this together so that it makes sense, but uh, here's where we are. Now, yes, we used a black porcelain, which means that it is gorgeous on the bottom, no little icky bits, but it's still just a little rough where it was touching the kiln, uh, the, like the furniture in the kiln. So I want to go ahead and smooth that out. I'm going to use some diamond sandpaper. I've got some 800 and I've got some 1500. I'm going to just use the 1500 if I can. I think that this does the greatest job. It, it just, I just want to just smooth it out so it doesn't scuff up a table and so it feels fantastic in your hand. Now, this is a super high grit sandpaper, which means that we need to use water to keep it from clogging up. Now, when you're using diamond sandpaper like this, you don't wanna like muscle it. You're just gonna, you let the diamonds do the work. It's just a gentle touch. Yeah, that's nice. Now I have to really make sure that I rinse this off after because the, uh, like the sawdust, if you will, the sanding, all the little clay particles that I've sanded away from this, they will look light gray. Uh, they'll be like a dust on this mug. So I wanna make sure I really wash all that off before I call this done. All right, uh, 10 minutes have gone by. So that means it's time to flip these molds over. Before we do that, I'm gonna just kind of tidy up my work area because I like to clean up as I go, especially with this black porcelain because it gets all over everything and I do not want to contaminate the rest of my studio with this black clay. Now the porcelain is still extremely soft. It's only been sitting in these molds uh, for, you know, 10 minutes, uh, but it's, it's gelled, it's skinned over. You can see it isn't just glugging out anymore. And what I wanna do right now before I stand the molds upright is just trim out this extra spilled bit on the top. Like I said, I have to clean as I go and this is just a good time to tackle this. And I'm flipping the molds back upright to let them dry out a little easier. If the opening is pointing up, the moisture can kind of evaporate and, you know, circulate with the air a lot better than it can if the molds are sitting upside down. Okay, we've still got like 18 minutes before I open the molds. So in the meantime, uh, using these little scraps that we've trimmed out of the molds, I want to show you some of the really weird stuff that porcelain does. It behaves totally differently than uh, the stoneware slip that I normally use in the studio. Uh, and that's all because of its bizarre, uh, like physical makeup of those little particles. That's all those little balls of clay in there instead of gravel, like I keep describing. And hopefully I, again, have put in a little graphic for you. Uh, but it's really weird that when you mess with it, now this seems, I mean, this is, it's still pretty soft. This is clearly soft. But the weird thing is, is the more that I mess with it, the softer it will get. If you've ever gone to the beach and you're at like where the ocean hits the, you know, on the shoreline there, the waves pull back and you see what looks like dry sand. But if you tap the sand like this, all of a sudden it'll get wet. Like it'll call up the water from inside of the sand. Um, and, and then that sand will get really soft. This, this, uh, this porcelain will do the exact same thing here. I'm going to switch camera angles so you can get close to it. Okay, so here we've got a piece of the uh, porcelain slip here, and it is still pretty soft, but if I tap an area on it, just keep tapping it, that area will get even softer. It's so weird. So the more you work in your, and look, it's just, now look, see where it's just kind of tearing right there? And it's, it's really hard to show, but it just gets, the more you move a spot, the more plastic it gets, and then all of a sudden it will just, give way, it'll just tear. Hmm, 
This is not a really good example. Let's look inside on one of the mugs. Maybe that'll give you a better example. Like I can totally feel it happening. It's just really hard to show it happening. Oh, this stuff is weird. It's like bubble gum. All right, let's look inside of the mug. Okay, so here you can see where I've cut away the, uh, I've trimmed away the excess slip. Now it's kind of a matte finish in here, but if I really, if I tap on this, It's not gonna, oh, there we go, there it goes. See how that's getting shiny right there? Isn't that weird? And it's also getting super soft right there where I'm tapping at it. And it's because I'm rearranging all those little ball uh, balls of porcelain and it's it's shifting around and calling the water up into the, and look at, now this is like super gummy and soft right there. This is still firm. This is super soft. It is the weirdest thing yeah, I could play with this forever. It's so strange. All righty, folks. It is time for some creator real talk. Now, this video has been living on my computer for months now. You may have noticed the beautiful summer sun coming through the windows and all those earlier shots. Well, it is now winter. It is 40-something degrees outside. It is dark. And I have taken forever to finish this. Why? Well, because I had in my head, I'm going to do this fancy animation describing the particle structure of porcelain and why it behaves different than clay. And that animation I had in my head and I want to look really good. And I just kept putting it off, putting it off, putting it off until months went by. And that's what kind of happens to myself. I can kind of self-sabotage in that way of chasing that perfect ideal that I have in my head. And in pursuit of that ideal, sometimes I will paralyze myself. I won't want to do the work because it's just got to be that perfect idea. So anyway, let's throw all that out. Let's throw away this concept of perfection. And I'm just going to show you why porcelain is different than clay using some models. Okay, here we go. Can I do this in one take? I don't know. Let's talk about clay. Here I have a example of what clay looks like under a microscope, like a super powerful microscope. So clay is made up of rocks. It comes out of the ground. So you're going to have lots of different minerals. You're going to have like some little maybe iron particles. You're going to have actual clay particles. You're going to have feldspar. You're going to have different things and all of these particles. And you're even going to have, sometimes they put in grog, which is clay that's been fired. And then they break it up and put it back into the clay. Just like when you add a uh, gravel to cement to make it stronger. When you're mixing it up, it strengthens the clay. Now, porcelain is very different. Porcelain is made up of refined clay particles, which look something like this. Note that they are very smooth. These are refined. They are sifted. They just sift and sift and sift until they get rid of all of those other minerals and additives, and they only have these perfect clay particles. And then they also add another thing, silica, aka glass. So this is what porcelain looks like. Now, there's another thing that's missing from both of these, and that is water. So give me one second. Add the silica. Now, if you're thinking, I just put an awful lot of silica into this porcelain, that's because silica is a major component of porcelain. Porcelain is very close to glass. It's about as close as you can get to glass in ceramics, aside from just glaze, which is almost all glass. Okay. So we have both of these, oh, don't want to forget the feldspar, and we add water to the mix because clay consists of a lot of water too when it's in its malleable state. Okay, now here's where we get the big difference and it comes down to how these things handle. Notice that it's rather difficult for me to push my finger into this clay. That's because these clay particles and minerals lock together and they have a lot of structural strength. That's why when you fire this in the kiln, it holds its shape. Now let's take a look at the porcelain. Ooh. See how these particles all really move around each other? Yeah, these things, these things really move. And that is why when you fire porcelain, these particles tend to slip and slide and porcelain will slump in the kiln. This is also why porcelain shrinks more. The grog, that previously fired clay that they put back into here, it doesn't shrink. It's already shrunk. All the shrinking, it's going to shrink. Where this stuff, 
you get rid of all of that water and all of this silica melts and bonds with the clay particles, you've got a lot of shrinkage going on. Anyway, I hope that helps. I can't believe this whole setup took me months to do. I should have just done the animation. Anyway, I promise not to let this happen again and I promise to try to, well, I'm not gonna say promise. I'm gonna do my best to get Tiki Technical Tuesday out a little more regularly than I have in the past. Whew, back to the video. Alrighty, it has been 45 minutes. We are going to open the mold. I've got my table nice and cleaned off. And because, as I showed you earlier, porcelain is weird, we want to take extreme care when we're taking these out of the molds, not to distort them, not to wiggle them. We don't want to give that uh, porcelain any, any reason to warp. And with that said, I have created this, the pounder cradle. Uh, and I cut these little circles in here just to, well, cradle the mugs when we take them out because of the rounded bottoms that they have. If I set them down, sure, they might be fine at first, but I guarantee that because of the structure of porcelain, it couldn't support its own weight. So this will help to support its weight while it dries. Let's go for it. Sometimes I have to use my mold pliers. This is, I guess it's an automotive snap ring plier. I will put a link to it in the description of the video. I put these little channels in the mold that lets me put this in and just kind of crack the mold, just help it open when I need to, when I feel it needs a little extra encouragement. I clean the molds as I go. So uh, this mold section, I'm just gonna quickly Get the ick out of it. Okay, so when you make molds, it's funny, you almost take them apart in the opposite way of when you poured the pieces. So I'll take the last piece that I poured off first and then in that order. That's just kind of as a rule, the way that it works because of the way that keys work, blah, blah, blah. It's not, it's not a law, it's just kind of the way that it sometimes happens. So I'm just giving a little wiggle. Just letting it know that we're gonna be opening it up. And I wanna be extra careful. There we go. Ah, and again, I'm gonna clean it up. This little bits of flashing that are on the mold edges. I wanna get that, get rid of that. Just be getting this mold ready for casting tomorrow. Ah, there we go. And onto the cradle. Now, I'm actually gonna go and have breakfast after I open all these molds. So in the meantime, I don't want them to dry out, so I'm gonna bag them. They should be fine under the bag. I've left them bagged for hours before, and they'll be totally fine, they won't dry out. Now I'm going to carefully reseat this mold to get it ready for casting tomorrow. Okay, let's do that two more times, but I think that we'll use the magic of time-lapse for your enjoyment. Okay, we've got the molds ready for casting tomorrow. We have our three castings of the day bagged uh, nice and safe so they won't dry out while I head off for breakfast, which today I think is oatmeal. I don't know, I think so, I don't know. I, I gotta check the list. Anyway, I'm excited about breakfast. Uh, I'm excited about seeing these guys. I'll be back in about an hour. All right, 
Breakfast was oatmeal. We've had it. It was delicious. And now it's time to begin seaming. First up, we're going to grab our tools. I'm using this Mud Tools, very soft sponge. I'm also using a Home Depot kind of classic sponge, like a tile grout sponge. I'm using this small loop tool by Xeom Tools, an X-Acto knife, and lastly, a, a rubber kidney tool by uh, Cheryl Mud Tools. I'll put links to all of these things in the description of this video. We kick things off by trimming the top uh, of the uh, mug off. This is the flashing, the little bit of extra clay where the uh, slip went in and out of the mold. I used an X-Acto knife to trim this away. And you'll notice I made another little cradle. I call this the pounder seaming cradle. It's like a one-off cradle to hold the piece while we are working on it. After we trim the top away, uh, I go through with two different sponges. I use the big Home Depot sponge to kind of level and smooth things out. And then I go back with the finer, soft uh, mud tool sponge to get a nice smooth surface. Okay, now we are going to tackle the flashing. That is the fancy name for this little line that appears on the seam where the two parts of the molds came together and a little bit of the slip pushed its way out into that gap between the mold pieces. Uh, we're going to remove it with this tiny little wire tool by, by Zeum Tools. I like this one uh, for doing the seams. And we're also going to do a little bit of compression because porcelain, much more than standard stoneware, has a memory. And even though we get rid of the seam line, like so, when we fire it, it might come back. So after I scrape it away, I'm going to go back and I'm really going to push that clay down and smooth it out. Uh, I want to kind of like realign those particles of, the particles of clay. I'll even use this smooth kidney and really just compress that porcelain down into a smooth surface. I should note that I go back and um, add a little bit of detail back on this seam edge just to kind of hide where the seam was. The fun thing about going back in and adding uh, some more stone texture and detailing around the area where I'm going back and seaming these, it means that no two of these are going to be identical. Every single uh, porcelain pounder out there is going to have a unique stone pattern around these seamed areas. And I think that kind of makes them unique. The final seam that we have to take care of is the one that runs around here, around the length of the, I don't know, the outer edge of the pounder. Uh, and this one is a pretty easy one to get rid of. Fortunately, the, the break is right on this, you know, this nice high angle. So it just makes it, it's just a, some seams are tricky and some seams are not, and this one is not. As I go along the seam, I'm adding in some like, you know, volcanic gas bubbles into the texture of the stone. After seaming and texturing with the small loop tool, I'll go back and compress the seam down with my finger and then go over the entire surface from bottom to top with the extra smooth uh, mud tool sponge. This sponge, it's, it's soft like a makeup sponge and it just gives a very nice smooth uniform surface over the entire casting. Okay, that should do it for this one. We're just gonna repeat it two more times. There is a lot of repetition in uh, production ceramics, and that is okay if you're into that, into the zen of doing the same action again and again and trying to nail it every time, then hey, ceramics is for you. It's also a fantastic time to listen to podcasts and hang out with people that you like to work with. Yeah. Alrighty, so there we go, all seamed up and ready to dry. These are going to sit here for... I don't know, an hour or so, just let them firm up a little bit more and then I will go back on the bottom and add their numbers. Like this is, as uh, I hopefully have mentioned at some point in this video, going to be an open edition. So what I'm doing is I'm just numbering each one as it goes along. First one, number one, second, number two, three, four, five, and so on. Maybe someday in five years, I'll hit number 500. Who knows? But for now, I believe that this is number... I think it is uh, number 10, 11, and 12, I think. Or it's 13, 14, 15. I don't know. We'll find out in about an hour. 
Okay, quick update on the seaming technique for the porcelain pounder. Uh, this is a few days, I guess a few weeks maybe after uh, I shot that initial thing on my seaming technique. Most of the tools I was using was this small tool. I switched things up a bit to this uh, stainless steel kidney. This is called a kidney tool because it looks like, well, a kidney. Uh, this one is made by Cheryl Mud Tools. I'll put a link to it in the profile. It is a beautiful little uh, stainless tool. And I'm using this now to go through and remove the seams. I found it just does a much better job. I let the porcelain pounders sit out a little bit longer um, so that they are, they're not quite leather hard, but they're getting there. And I will knock the seam down that way. Then I go back. Of course, I still want to add in that texture detail that I, uh, you know, that kind of gets removed on the seam line to make it look like the rock. But uh, I just love the way that this tool takes the seams down. Um, I can get away with this tool on this mug because of its shape. It's such a round shape uh, and it's a very smooth plane overall uh, that this just, I found, works better. And of course, I want to do compression. After I clean the seam away, I'll go back and uh, compress with my finger, get that surface uniform. Yeah, I really like the way this works. Anyway, back to the video. Alrighty, I am back from lunch. These have dried out a little bit. They're approaching the leather hard stage. And I now know that this is number 12, 13, no, wait, no, 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 no. 13, 14, and 15. How do I know this? Well, because I keep a log because I clearly can't remember this in my head. This is supposed to be an ongoing open edition. So I'm gonna carefully keep a log where I write down the date that I cast them, the number that I cast that day, and then keep a running tally of how many mugs total that we have. Um, that being said, let's mark them. I'm gonna use a little tool that I got uh, many, many years ago in Japan. It's one of my favorite little tools. Got it from the store called Tokyo Hands, which is like, oh my God, it's an incredible place. If you are an artist or a maker and you are in Japan, you've got to go to Tokyo Hands. 13, 14, 15, 13, 14, 15. 13, 14, 15, okay. All right, we are rejoining the pounder adventure after a bisque firing. We have let the pounders sit on the shelf for a few days to completely dry out, and then we've put them through a first firing to just firm them up. Uh, when we do a bisque firing, what this means is we are like just tacking all those particles of clay together in the kiln. They've all gotten to the point where they're doing a little bit of shrinking, but they're still porous. That porosity is key because we're gonna need that porosity for the glaze to really bond to these pieces. All right, it's time to get some glaze onto these mugs. They've been bisqued, they look fantastic, and it's a little tricky with the glaze. Now, uh, I have done lots of tests on this porcelain um, because porcelain really shrinks when you fire it, and it also does some other weird things. Um, so what we're gonna do with these is we're only gonna glaze the inside. Um, why? Well, because that is why we're using the black porcelain. Uh, we won't have to glaze it outside because it is already going to be a gorgeous stone looking black. And best of all, we won't have to worry about any glaze on this smooth bottom sticking to the bottom of the kiln or under glaze or anything like that because what you see is what you get. That's the goal of this whole process. For this first run of the, um, the porcelain pounders, I think I'm gonna do a, just a beautiful satin black interior. So it'll just look like a solid piece of volcanic basalt. That's the goal. Uh, and because porcelain is so persnickety, we're going to strain our glaze before we use it. Okay, so I have found through all the testing that uh, this Amico satin matte black glaze works well with the porcelain. The porcelain shrinkage rate is 12% and it moves around the kiln and this stuff seems to be able to keep up with it. At least it survived a test or two. Uh, hopefully we will not destroy a whole kiln mode of our actual production run. But this stuff, while it is fabulous, Amico, I love you and you once sponsored me on Instagram and I appreciate that. Um, it still can sometimes have little itty bitty things in it. So I want to actually run it through this. This is a Laguna 
80 mesh laboratory sieve, sieve, am I saying that right? I sure hope so. Um, and it's uh, basically, it's a mesh. The 80 is a measurement of the fineness, the degree of like how closely knit this little mesh is. Uh, you can just kind of see my hand through here. 80 is pretty darn fine. This is a really thin, thin mesh. And we are going to push our glaze through this. Now this one is giant. It's designed to sit on like a five gallon bucket. I'm gonna be using this. They do make smaller ones. I don't have one in the studio because I use this for making a uh, slip in for, uh, you know, like sifting, dip, dipping glazes. Since we're doing these porcelain mugs, I think I might have to go and get, they make smaller size ones that would fit over it like a little, uh, like a, just a smaller retainer. This is pretty big, but we're gonna make this work. This is what we have in the studio today. Uh, we'll use this for a while and decide if we need to change, but using them is pretty simple. You just put the slip into here and let it drip down into the bucket underneath. And uh, because this is such a fine mesh, I'll probably have to like work it through with my hand just to kind of push it through this really fine surface. Let's do it. I should say, as a rule, all of the glazes that I get from both Amico and Mako are fabulous. They are well mixed, they don't pancake, they don't like, you know, when you store them for a while, they don't all compress and fall out of suspension. I love their glazes. I'm just doing this as an extra, extra precautionary step uh, because when I'm lining uh, mugs, the last thing you want is like a little particle of undermixed glaze, just, and you don't want anything in there. Sometimes, even if you're using a container and when you open it, there's some dried glaze on the rim and that falls in while you're pouring it in, it can just make a little bump. Now, chances are when you fire it, that'll all even out, but sometimes it doesn't. So I'm just, just being extra, extra careful. Okay, you can see just a little bit of stuff here that is struggling to get through the, uh, the screen. Now, if I work it, some of this will break up and make its way through the screen, but some of it doesn't want to. And this is the kind of stuff that I just want to avoid catching uh, while we're doing the lining on these mugs. Again, I love Amico. This is not a, I'm in no way seeing this as a bad glaze. Uh, if I'm spraying this glaze, I never even bother doing this step. Uh, and often, even when I'm lining mugs, I rarely will do this step with Mako and Amico glazes because they're so good. But I'm just, this is porcelain. I just want to be extra, extra sure. All right, I have got a big container of water. I have got a sponge. Aha! And I'm going to put the... Uh, the clarified glaze into a pouring container. Boop, boop, boop. And I think we're ready to go for it. Oh, I forgot a step and that is making sure there's nothing in here. Let's take care of that. So throughout the trimming process, you know, when we seam these things, sometimes little bits of clay fall inside of here and they get fired and they're in there in the bottom of the mug. Now, they haven't really, you know, attached themselves to the bottom of the mug because it's just like, like sawdust, if you will, falling into there. So I'll take a brush like so and just work my way around on the inside and get all those little bits out. Now, they're mostly out, but then I'm gonna go into the glaze room and hook up the compressor with like a ch -ch -ch nozzle and blow air out of here. I'm not going to do that on camera because, well, it's a complete mess in there and also it is super loud. But that's what I'm gonna do. Well, all right, maybe I'll just show it and uh, just so you know what I'm talking about. But yeah, you just wanna blow and just make sure it's absolutely clean in here before we add any glaze. Because if I have all these little bits of porcelain floating around in there, we put our glaze in there, it's just gonna, it'll be chunky, it'll be icky. We don't want any ick, so. I'm, I'm glad I remembered this step. Okay, mug interiors are clean now. I didn't film it, I'm sorry. I, I kinda, I'm kinda under the gun with time. TikiCon is next weekend. We are doing a special project for TikiCon. and I just gotta get it done. So we're squeezing this kiln load in with that special project kiln load in. I just gotta get these in the kiln. 
as much as I love making Tiki Kit Technical Tuesday, uh, setting up the camera takes time and, oh my God, just talking about this is taking time. Let's just get the glaze in these things. Okay, let's go. So we're gonna do a lining. So I'm gonna fill this up, me, not all the way, like I guess halfway, like so. And this is why I like to have the sponge standing by. Are you ready for this? A little drip and then boop, there we go. Okay, so I'm just gonna move this around Get the uh, glaze right up to the edge. And then we dump. Now, some folks actually build glaze fountains. We have them in the studio. We use it sometimes, but you need to have a lot of glaze in it for the fountain to work. And honestly, I uh, sometimes can get frustrated with glaze fountains. Uh, they can get gummed up. And I just felt it was a little wasteful. Yes, this takes more time because I'm sitting here, I'm waiting for it to drip and all that stuff. But I find it's a little soothing. And I realize the irony of me saying I don't have time to film myself blowing air into these things. And yet I am taking the time to do this, but such is life. Um, and isn't this more fun to watch than me blowing compressed air into a, a mug? Maybe, I don't know. All right, so that looks like enough. So once it's done, most of it's dripping, I will just do it just a slight, I'll just catch those drops and then quick flip. And there we go. Now the edge here has a little unevenness. So I'm gonna go back with a brush and just even that out. Brush. All right, we repeat eight more times. Okay, so we're taking these bisqued pieces and we're gonna be putting them into the kiln and doing a glaze firing. That's the highest temperature firing that we're gonna be doing on these mugs. And it's gonna get this porcelain to a point of vitrification, meaning that it's going to basically almost melt into one body of clay. And in porcelain's case, it's almost more like glass. Now you'll notice that there is a nice rounded bottom on this mug. It's a beautiful, like, you know, half circle shape. That's gonna change in this firing. And I didn't know how much it would change. I know that porcelain tends to slump because of its shape. It's kind of particulate structure. It's made of a bunch of like little round shapes as I think I may have discussed hopefully in a graphic before this. Um, so those round shapes tend to slide over each other during the firing process, which means it can slump. It'll change just a little bit. How much will it change? I didn't know until I fired it. And I don't know how much these are gonna change. I have only fired one in a kiln at a time. This is the first time I'm putting more than one in a kiln. So the temperature is gonna change a little. Maybe it'll be a little hotter, maybe be a little cooler. I don't know, but we're gonna pack them in there and we're gonna cross our fingers and whew, I hope that they don't slump too much. I hope that they slump just the perfect amount like they have been in all of my tests. All right, it is a couple days since I did that uh, glaze firing of the porcelain pounders. We're gonna take a look. I haven't looked in here. I let it cool as long as it needed to cool. This has been cooling for two days. I didn't wanna push this at all. Oh, I really hope this worked. Let's take a look. Oh, oh boy. Oh, they look okay, I think. I think they're okay. Oh, they look really okay. So this is where you can see the distortion and the shrinkage of porcelain. So as like I hopefully mentioned in a graphic, porcelain is made of like a ball clay. It's like a bunch of little marbles hanging out together. And when you put them in the kiln and they get hot, they shrink a lot, 12%, and they tend to slump. So if you look at the bottom of these, they've now got a flat spot on them. They used to be completely round like a half hemisphere, and now they've got a little flat bit. And that's totally fine with me because look at that beautiful black all the way around. There's no little bot spots that stick and turn white from sticking to the bottom of the kiln. Ah, fabulous. Well, this brings us to the end of the porcelain pounder journey. Here they are 
awaiting boxing up and shipping off to their new homes. This is the final step after we sand the bottoms and we put them on the web store. They come into this uh, part of the studio for Mrs. Vantiki to delicately wrap them and uh, cradle them in the finest of wraps uh, so they can ship off to their new homes. Now, um, if you missed the episode where we sculpted these, or if you want to learn more about the process of slip casting and how slip casting works, I will put some links here at the end of this video. Uh, and I want to thank you for going on this little porcelain pounder journey with me. Uh, I loved making these. I learned a lot about these. It's a whole new material for me to work with, and it's a lot of fun. And I am just so happy with the end results. I think they are just gorgeous and they feel so good in the hand. Um, thank you for watching, and I will see you on the next episode of Tiki Technical Tuesday.